WWF Smackdown was released on March 2000 in North America and April 2000 in Europe. A Japanese release came later in the summer, marking the beginning of a very successful partnership between the WWF and Ukes Interactive. The very first Smackdown game on PlayStation 1 gave fans of wrestling video games a brand new way to play WWF matches. Gone were the button combinations of Warzone and Attitude, gone were the clunky looking character animations and rather slow gameplay. WWF Smackdown was a breath of fresh air that got PlayStation owners really excited. Today we're going to play a few matches of Smackdown on PS1, we'll take a look at everything the game had to offer, and we'll try to figure out what made this game so special and why many felt it was leagues better than other wrestling games available on the PlayStation. WWF Smackdown was not Uke's first wrestling game. That honour goes to NJPW Token Ritsudan, localised in North America and Europe, as Power Move Pro Wrestling. I've got fond memories of Power Move Pro Wrestling and I think I talked about this ages ago in my In Your House PS1 video, but there was a Christmas where I got WCW vs The World, In Your House and Power Move as presents from Santa Claus, and I spent so much time playing these three games. Back then I didn't know a thing about localization of games and things of that nature, but I did always find it odd that there was a New Japan logo in the game where the lion was replaced by a bulldog. Same as WCW vs The World, I didn't understand why Jushin Liger and Terry Funk were in the game with different names. I just thought the development team were giving us knockoff wrestlers so they didn't have to pay royalties. Back to Power Move though and Yuke's first ever wrestling game. This one was pretty limited when it came to the moves you could pull off in the ring but it controlled really really well. Area 51 here was my guy, and I remember recording matches onto the PS1 memory card with every intention of putting on 5 star matches. I'd saved the match onto the memory card which if I recall correctly nearly took up all the space available, and I'd never watch the match back, I'd always record a new one. It was interesting though how this was accomplished, I'm no expert but I think it was the button presses that were being recorded, meaning when you replay your match the PS1 was just inputting the same commands for both you and the CPU. Anyway going off track here, Power Move Pro Wrestling was decent, I have good memories of the game but Smackdown 1 really has no relation to Power Move other than the game sharing developers. Smackdown was not based around Power Move, nor was the Smackdown engine based on Power Move. Ukes released another wrestling game titled The Pro Wrestling as part of the Simple series. The Simple series was a line of budget price games that saw releases on everything from the Game Boy Advance all the way to the Xbox 360 and Wii U. You can instantly see the resemblance here with how the characters move and just the general look of the game. This right here is the very foundation of the Smackdown games, but I should note also that the Pro Wrestling and Smackdown 1 were in development around the same time period. The Pro Wrestling was released in Japan before Smackdown hit the United States though, and we can confirm that both games were in development at the same time, because WWF Superstar names can be found in the debug menu of the Pro Wrestling. What's interesting too is the fact that the pro wrestling has body part fatigue indicators, this is something that Ukes wouldn't implement in a WWF game until Smackdown Here Comes the Pain. There was also a sequel to the pro wrestling but we'll talk about that another time. Boot up Smackdown on your PS1 and you'll get greeted with a video showing Smackdown clips with the original iconic theme playing in the background. Press start at the title screen and then you'll get brought to the main menu. What you'll then notice is just how good the overall menu presentation is and how it closely represents the overall theme of the Smackdown TV show. Everything looks good here. You have an absolute ton of options and we're going to look at everything the game has to offer, so let's start with the roster before checking out gameplay. I'll scroll through the available characters here so you can have a look. Smackdown has 36 selectable wrestlers and you've got all your big hitters here from the Attitude Era. Steve Austin, The Rock, Triple H, Kane, The Undertaker, you've even got Vince McMahon and Shane McMahon. There's a selection of female wrestlers too, Paul Bearer is selectable for some reason. All in all it's a good roster here for the time period. You won't be unlocking new superstars either unfortunately, but you will unlock creator wrestler parts to make WWF wrestlers. Other superstars available include Stevie Richards, The Blue Meanie and Stephanie McMahon. We'll talk a little more about Creator Wrestler in a moment. 
pick your superstars and here's what the entrances look like in SmackDown. You get the superstars entrance video playing on full screen while the character walks in front of the video. It was a pretty novel way of showing entrances and I didn't mind this at all at the time. It was great to see the Titantron videos even if there was a superstar walking in front of it. This is all upscaled by the way and well the characters look okay for the time. You'll find some that look funny or a bit weird but it's a PS1 game. It's nowhere near as bad as WCW Mayhem and some of the characters are an improvement over WWF Warzone and WWF Attitude in my opinion anyway. Some look good and some don't. Take a look at the standard Smackdown arena here and really this comes down to preference if you think this looks better than Attitude's arena. Things are a lot more lively, there's a lot more colour, the stage looks great for the time and the ring looks good too, but some might say that the audience looks a little busy and the 2 or 3 frames of animation the crowd has is a little, well it just doesn't look all that good, but overall I think Smackdown does look better than Attitude. It isn't all about how it looks though, Smackdown play is completely different to any WWF game that came before it and this is where the game truly shines. Taking cues from the Aki wrestling games, Smackdown simplifies the controls meaning anyone can learn how to play in a matter of seconds. Face buttons on your controller will allow you to strike, pull off grapple moves, run and counter. Shoulder buttons let you taunt, get in and out of the ring, change focus for multi-man matches and pull off special moves. And that's all you need to know to get started. Whereas Warzone and Attitude demanded players to learn button combinations and line up your attacks perfectly with precise timing, Smackdown feels more like an arcade game where things are much more simple and generally much easier. This may sound like a downgrade but it really isn't. Smackdown's much more basic and much more sensible control scheme results in a much more fluid and fun gameplay experience where the action is more frantic but still more enjoyable. Now that's not to say there isn't problems to be found in the gameplay, there will be a lot of people out there who don't like the rather unrealistic quick pace of Smackdown and how matches don't really simulate what a real wrestling match plays out like, especially when it comes to recovery times. But well, if you want real wrestling then watch a pay per view. Smackdown is all about fast gameplay and after PS1 owning WWF fans had to put up with Warzone and Attitude, this game right here was a welcome change. Move animations look good, character outfits look good, everyone had their special move and all you had to do was fill up a special slot to pull it off with one button press. Superstars also had a wide range of moves that differed from wrestler to wrestler. And really, there isn't much else to say about the actual in-ring gameplay. It's easy and it's fun. That's maybe at the cost of true depth but that's not really what Smackdown is all about. The game's sequels would add more depth and play mechanics with each installment. This is a series that got better and better over time and for me anyway, it's just fascinating seeing where it all began. What you're seeing here is the very core of the WWF UX wrestling engine and this engine would continue to evolve right into 2K series of WWE games. With this being the first entry in the Smackdown series though, you gotta keep expectations in check especially if you plan on playing again today. I'm certainly not gonna put Smackdown 1 on a pedestal like others do, it does play well and it is a good time but I think one of the main reasons it gets so much praise is because of what came before it. The shift in gameplay really stood out after playing the Acclaim games so I think us players back in the day were just happy to have something different. As mentioned, Smackdown would continue to get better and better. I'm sure many would agree that Smackdown 2 was better than the original. We then had the PS2 Smackdown games with some of those still being regarded as some of the best wrestling games of all time. Smackdown absolutely destroys attitude when it comes to game modes and match types. There's a lot to do here. Along with one on one tag team matches and handicap matches, you can play battle royals, the royal rumble, the king of the ring, hardcore matches, false count anywhere matches, cage matches, survival matches, special referee matches and I quit matches. Special referee matches were great for messing your mates around and trying to be a fair referee is actually way harder than you think. In regards to the Falls Count Anywhere matches and hardcore matches, 
There's backstage areas available and you can choose to start your match away from the ring. Weapon implementation isn't great here but it's on par with previous games. This is something that would greatly improve over time. In I Quit matches you'll grab a microphone and try to make your opponent say the magic words. It was nice to have this mode but using the mic was pretty much the same as pinning your opponent. Match variety though was important in wrestling games during this time period and you guys who watched my previous PS1 wrestling game videos would know that lack of match types could be detrimental to a game. Smackdown has enough variety to keep you going with the sequel adding even more match types but we'll talk about Smackdown 2 another time. Out in the main menu we have a few modes to check out, you can create your own pay per view and this mode is actually pretty interesting. Previous games would let you set out your own pay per view, maybe give it its own arena and let you save your event to play at a later date. But in Smackdown, the shows and matches that you book get an audience score, the better the matches the higher the score. Your event will then enter a leaderboard where you can compare your shows and you can also see where your matches scored in comparison to previous events. It's interesting for sure and it's almost like a very very early version of GM mode. You can also simulate matches here so if you just want to book shows and see how that show did in terms of popularity then you're free to do so. Belt records and rankings is where you can check out all the belt holders on your current save file along with play data based on each individual superstar. The higher their win record, the higher their overall rank. And then you have create a wrestler mode. First you'll need to set their profile. You'll then go in to change your superstars appearance and basically you've got a mix and match system where you can change up current superstars in the game or use some of the custom options. You can mix up male and female wrestlers, you can use some of the weird original parts added by developers. So if you ever wanted to play as Kane only he has a giant dinosaur head then go right ahead. You can then alter your wrestlers personality, this lets you set things like a character speciality match along with how the CPU would control the character should you ever want to battle your own creation. Set the moves, set the abilities and fighting style and now you're ready to take Dino Kane into the ring to take care of his older brother. Your created character is gonna be incredibly limited though. Not only do you need to boost stats, but you need to unlock better moves. And that's where the season mode comes into play. So you've got a standard season mode and you've got a pre-season mode. Pre-season can only be played with your created superstar and its main purpose is to build your superstar up by unlocking stat points. This was pretty unique at the time and while some may see it as extra work, others will enjoy taking their created superstar on a longer journey. Each match equals one month, preseason will have you working house shows mainly to start off with and cutscenes will play to progress your story. And once you complete the preseason, you can take your character into the main season mode. Main season mode can also be played with a standard WWF superstar. You can even pick the current WWF champion to begin your season right at the top and things are furthered along with cutscenes and dialogue boxes to keep things interesting. Compared to Attitude, Season Mode is excellent. Compared to other Smackdown games, it's just okay. But it's definitely a step in the right direction and it gives players more than just match after match. You can even watch other matches that your character has nothing to do with. And if you really don't want to play matches at all, you can simulate your entire season. Something I like about season mode is the fact that you can see what everyone gets up to and not just your character, but on the flip side of this, sometimes your chosen character won't interact with anybody and you won't see cutscenes for your superstar. You get much more of that in pre-season mode. Another positive though is the fact that season mode will make your game completely unique with every match and every stat getting recorded into your save file. Your save file is going to look way different to your friend's save file and your superstar rankings will also vary greatly. And this is a good thing. WWF Smackdown on PlayStation 1 was definitely a foundation for future games to build on. Those of you who skipped this one but still played later Smackdown games will get the grips with it right away. And it's crazy how the basics of Smackdown 1 were carried over for years and years later. Yooks had an instant winner here and they knew where to improve and where to make changes. 
Many would say the engine outstayed its welcome however and many of the later games didn't change too much, and I'd actually agree with that statement. I'm a big fan of the more unusual wrestling games, for lack of a better term. Games like WWF All Stars, Legends of WrestleMania, even WrestleMania the Arcade game which I know a lot of people don't like. I enjoyed those games and I think that's because WWF games typically didn't deviate too much after the release of Smackdown. You can't blame Ukes or WWF either though, the Smackdown series became incredibly successful and for a few years at least, every new addition added a whole lot of new things that kept us coming back for more. But I do think that the engine itself may have outstayed its welcome and we could have benefited from a few other studios having a shot at the WWF license. We did get WrestleMania 21 and the Raw games on Xbox that use different studios. Mania 21 is an oddity for sure and I'm going to cover that game very soon. In the Raw games, some people liked them, others didn't. But Raw 2 had some interesting creative options such as using custom music for superstars. And also, the creation suite itself I thought was great. I will talk about these other games in the future for sure but I'm digressing here a little too. There's a reason why the Smackdown games were king of the mountain and even though I may feel the games got a little repetitive after a certain amount of time, that doesn't mean others didn't enjoy them. Smackdown Shut Your Mouth and Here Comes the Pain are two of my all time favourite wrestling games and I also enjoyed Smackdown vs Raw 2006 for GM mode. Here Comes the Pain is considered by many to be the absolute cream of the crop and all those great games can be traced right back to Smackdown on PS1. It was truly the beginning of a very successful run of games for the WWF, Ukes Interactive and publisher THQ. That'll do it for today guys, thank you so much for watching and take care. Here's one that's been requested a few times, Smackdown 2, Know Your Role on PlayStation 1. Got a story about this one too. All those years ago I had a modded PS1 that played copied games, or a chipped PlayStation as they were called around these neck of the woods. In every copy of Smackdown 2 that had been illegally burned to disc that I got my hands on didn't get past a certain bit in season mode. There must have been a huge batch of bad PAL copies because practically everyone I knew who had a modded PlayStation had the same problem that I did though I'm sure it wasn't an issue for you pirates in the states, or maybe it was, I don't know. So I had to actually buy a full retail copy of Smackdown 2 back in the day, imagine that, and what an improvement the game was in comparison to the original Smackdown. What you may have forgot though is that Smackdown 2 was released mere months after the original. Smackdown 1 was released in March 2000 in North America and April 2000 in Europe. Smackdown 2 was released in November and December the same year. It makes you think, maybe developer Ukes had a lot of ideas for the first game that didn't get implemented on time and so those ideas were brought over to Smackdown 2, maybe. Graphically, the games do look the same with the sequel looking a little more clean in places but overall the graphical enhancements aren't much to talk about, and the way the game plays is more or less the same with small tweaks being made here and there along with certain animations getting speed alterations. On the surface, Smackdown 2 Know Your Row looks and plays pretty much the same but once you begin digging into the game modes available along with the roster and the new match types, you'll quickly learn that it's a worthy successor even if you already own Smackdown 1. Let's get started then and we'll take a look at Smackdown 2 Know Your Row in today's video. Smackdown 1 received good reviews and it sold pretty well too. It was by far the most feature rich wrestling game available on PlayStation 1 and while it maybe didn't hit the same as the N64 Aki wrestling games, Smackdown was still pretty enjoyable, especially in multiplayer. After WWF Warzone and Attitude, grapple fans were just happy to get a WWF game that played different and this, combined with the World Wrestling Federation's success from a television standpoint during the game's release, ensured that WWF Smackdown would be a hot selling release. Ukes and publisher THQ wasted no time in getting the sequel out the door. As mentioned, Smackdown 2 looked and played a lot like its predecessor and Ukes clearly didn't spend a whole lot of time
time updating the game engine either, but what fans got here was even more features and modes jam packed onto a single disc and for many, Smackdown 2 quickly became the essential wrestling game on Sony's Playstation console. Many would say it wouldn't get any better on the PS1 after Smackdown 2 hit the shelves and finally, after Wrestlemania the arcade game, which I loved by the way, in your house, Warzone, Attitude and the first Smackdown game, the WWF finally had a PS1 game that was actually great. Not good, but great. Before we dig into these new game modes and whatnot, let me show you how to play Smackdown 1 and 2 because I don't think I went through this in the original Smackdown video. What's great about Smackdown 1 and 2 on PS1 is the fact that it's extremely accessible. In comparison to the N64 wrestling games, it's even easier to control. And while some would say it's maybe too simple and maybe too basic, the easier controls did mean that anyone could play this thing. No one would get turned off by button combinations or wondering what a certain button does in the middle of a match because it all becomes instinctive after just one bout. The X button or the cross button performs strikes. A different direction with X gives you a different strike. The circle button with a direction will give you a grapple move. If your opponent's in a dazed state, you'll be able to perform a stronger grapple move. And if you top circle without a direction, you'll perform an Irish whip. You can run with the triangle button and you can follow this up with a strike or a grapple or you can roll around, jump over and slide under your opponent. The square button will block and perform counters. Your finishing moves are performed with the L1 button. R1 is your action button for picking up weapons, getting in and out of the ring, things like that. And honestly, that's all you need to know for Smackdown 1 and 2. Oh, down in circle pins your opponent, you'll probably need to know that too. The PS1 Smackdown games without a doubt are the easiest WWF games to play and this was part of the game's appeal. Anyone could have a go at this and you'd probably have a tougher time trying to convince your friends to have that first game, but once they did, they got hooked in just like the rest of us. The speed has been ever so slightly increased too. Matches aren't very long here and recovery time for a down superstar is mere seconds. You're constantly fighting in Smackdown 2 and it does feel more like a fast paced arcade game at times and not so much a wrestling game where you put on long epic encounters, but again, that was the appeal. WWF fans were probably getting a little fed up with pressing forward, down, up, square and X together to perform a finishing move and they just wanted a pick up and play WWF game with no messing around. Smackdown 2 definitely provided that. Let's look at the roster, I'll just go through it here and you can have a look for yourself. Smackdown 1 had 36 wrestlers to choose from whereas Smackdown 2 has 66 wrestlers in total once everything's been unlocked. 68 if we include two guys who were non-selectable but still accessible through game shark codes. We'll talk about that in a moment though. The roster here is extremely similar to WWF No Mercy, a game that was released mere days before Smackdown 2. So yeah, November 2000 was a pretty good month for WWF fans. We've got the Mean Street Posse here, the Hardy Boys, Undertaker and Kane, D-Generation X including Shawn Michaels as an unlockable character, Steve Blackman's here which is always a good thing. We've got Too Cool, the McMahons, the Stooges, the Right to Censor, the Radicals are all accounted for and we've got a reasonable enough women's roster too including Ivory, Jacqueline, Lita, Trish, China, and others. Getting almost double the roster size would have been enough to make some fans buy Smackdown 2 without hesitation so you can't fault the player selection. It's the most impressive WWF roster for the PlayStation 1 by far. Those two non-selectable wrestlers I mentioned are Ken Shamrock and The Big Show. Their models and movesets are still included on the disc but they can only be selected after entering a game shark code. Shamrock had left the World Wrestling Federation while Smackdown 2 was in development so Ukes were able to take him out after the request came from WWF but The Big Show story is a bit more interesting. Paul White was still signed to the World Wrestling Federation, however he was sent to developmental territory OVW to get in shape and improve his in-ring abilities. Jim Ross, the head of talent relations at the time, recently said he was worried that the athletic commission wouldn't give Show a license to wrestle if he didn't drop some weight, and Ross was also concerned about Paul's overall health. But it sounds like the WWF weren't too concerned about the Big Show's wallet because Paul would receive no royalties for Smackdown 2 because he was removed from the selectable roster and hidden away from plain sight. Still, with emulators and all that stuff, it's pretty easy to get access to both Shamrock and The Big Show if you really want to play as those guys.
match types then, SmackDown 2 has quite a few new additions. The Hell in a Cell makes its WWF game debut here, and yeah, it's primitive, but at least it's here. You bust through the cell using these metal panels, and when on top of the cage you can slam your opponent through the ceiling. The area you've got to do this is quite small though, so you've got to spend a little time lining your opponent up. Ladder matches are here too, and that title belt hanging from the ceiling is gonna swing around like crazy. It's your job to time your grab perfectly, and leave the match holding the prize. Fans could play casket matches for the first time ever, and these are pretty hilarious to look back on. Wrestlers pick up the casket like it's absolutely nothing, and they can even throw the casket at their opponents. All you gotta do is set the casket down, whip your opponent into it, and beat your opponent up so bad that the lid closes itself. Again, it's extremely primitive, but at least it's here. I do wish though that 2K would get the finger out and add things like casket matches and buried alive matches back into the new games. Hardcore and False Count Anywhere matches are available, but now you can travel all around the arena while fighting your opponent. There's a ton of areas you can visit and everything's linked up, meaning you can battle in every location before bringing your opponent back to the ring, if you choose to do so. And you've also got returning match types such as cage matches, special referee matches, I quit matches, and an assortment of multi-man matches from tags to triple threats to fatal four ways, all of which have additional options and modifiers. Gameplay's locked at 30 frames per second, but it doesn't dip at all when more than two guys are in the ring. But the load times can be a bit of a hassle, especially in Royal Rumble matches. Take a look here, the next character to come into the Royal Rumble isn't preloaded in the background. It's just the way PS1 games were. Instead, the game completely stops once someone's been eliminated, and the match resumes once that character's been loaded in. This was way more tolerable back in the day, but when you play the game now, it does get a bit annoying. Along with Battle Royals, King of the Ring tournaments and a survival mode, there's also the slobber knocker mode. Basically, defeat as many guys as possible within a time limit and put your name on the leaderboard. Creator Wrestler modes back in SmackDown 2, and this was really when Creator Wrestler got good for WWF fans. Last time around, you were choosing from templates, really, and using parts unlocked in season mode. There wasn't much customization available. SmackDown 2, on the other hand, gives fans a ton of options and lots of parts to edit with for the first time ever, really, and players could now create wrestlers that looked at least a little similar to other superstars not featured in the game. Don't worry about this guy I created, I don't know what the fuck I was doing here. It's still nothing compared to what we would get in subsequent games, but back then, this was quite a lot. And Create a Wrestler also lets us see what's going on under the hood in season mode in terms of how relationships work, and how likely it is that a wrestler will perform in a certain match type. You can set up relationships in Create a Wrestler mode, who does your wrestler like and who does your wrestler dislike. You can choose match specialities that will increase the chances of a certain superstar winning simulated matchups, depending on the match type. And you can also set stats and CPU logic. So there's quite a bit going on here, and for those who like to meticulously create their own customized federations with allies, foes, and individual specialities, well, SmackDown 2 had you covered. Before looking at season mode though, there's a couple of other things I need to show you. Create a taunt lets you build a taunt by selecting two predetermined animations. You'll see some familiar motions in here, such as Hulk Hogan's poses and Goldberg's jump after he performs a spear. Nothing too exciting, but it did give your created superstars a bit more personality especially if you were trying to create some real life superstars from other promotions. Create a stable lets you create tag teams and factions, you can edit their entrance music here and edit their entrance animations. Create a pay per view lets you set up your own events and you'll get scored on show quality once it's been completed. You can play matches or simulate matches, but the load times can be a killer here, especially when booking your event. It's a fantastic idea though, it's like a very early GM mode. Create a manager is also available, and this lets you assign a manager to any superstar. Rankings let you see who the champions are in your game and who's contending for the belts. Though I think my game's broken, The Rock's the current women's champion, and the only person in line for a title shot is also The Rock, while all the ladies, plus Vince McMahon, are contending for the light heavyweight title. It's weird. Alright, let's play season mode. In this mode, you'll go through two Raw shows, two Smackdown shows, and a pay per view every month, and the mode's gonna last for two years. You pick your superstar, I pick The Rock, you see the card for the show, and you gotta check to see if you're booked. 
Now, regardless if you're booked or not, you're going to have to simulate every other match and you're going to have to watch these energy bars go down until someone's named the winner. It kind of reminds me of the old football manager games. The same music plays for every simulated match and it gets real old real fast. So if you plan on playing this, make sure you've got your own tunes lined up because hearing the Raw theme, the Smackdown theme and that simulation music over and over again is going to drive you up the wall. Three fucking weeks I sat through and I didn't get booked. I'm The Rock and Paul Bear was getting booked in matches, what the hell? And then I remembered, The Rock's the current women's champion for whatever reason and The Rock's the only person contending for the belt. I'm not sure if those game shark codes they unlock Sean Rock and Big Show messed up my game, so I restarted and I picked Steve Austin this time. And yeah, there we go, we've got a match. So what's good here is that you can see the logic in relationships working almost right away with the matches the game's generating. Match bookings do make sense, not including The Rock holding the women's belt, but after week 1 I was put in a feud with Vince McMahon and by week 3 McMahon was attacking me before matches and all that stuff. You're gonna see cutscenes for other wrestlers too, guys wondering who their opponent's gonna be for the evening, or guys complaining about losing matches. That's all well and good and in comparison to Smackdown 1 season mode it's actually pretty awesome. This kind of thing is exactly what wrestling fans wanted in their single player experiences, but fuck does it get repetitive really really fast. It's another step in the right direction, people really like to get immersed in wrestling games particularly when it comes to overseeing the whole federation, and that's all good, but having to go through every single match to simulate the outcome, and having to watch uneventful cutscenes with loading screens in between becomes a real fucking drag in practically no time at all. Going through this just to capture this footage was bad enough and I really couldn't imagine going through over 100 shows just to complete the game nowadays. In saying that though, it is different looking back at things like this retrospectively. Back then I loved this and it didn't bother me half as much as it does now. I even went out and bought the game after season mode crashed on a pirated copy so I liked season mode enough that I would actually buy the game you know. It's unfair to say it's awful nowadays because back then it would have been the season mode that fans had longed for, but I can't imagine anyone wanting to play this now with all the other offerings we currently have because Smackdown 2 season mode just drags on and on and on. As mentioned, there are other cutscenes in the game every now and then, including Stone Cold wrecking the DX Express for example, but that's around 30 seconds enjoyment after sinking in around 60 minutes of load screens and match simulations. The character specific cutscenes are few and far between and it's just not worth sitting through nowadays. Quite simply, we've been spoiled by the Smackdown games that came after Smackdown 2 Know Your Role. I must reiterate though, because I'm sure many of you enjoyed this back in the day like I did. This was great over 20 years ago and we did have a lot more patience back then when it came to this kind of thing. You have to appreciate the relationships and the logic going on in the background, and it's good how match bookings are more or less on point. But if you're looking to play matches quite consistently, season mode won't be for you. You spend more time in menus than you do playing the game, and if there was just an option to simulate all matches with one button press then it would have been a bit more tolerable in 2022. Also, I unlocked Steve Austin while playing as Steve Austin. <laughs> Again, I think the game shark codes are causing all sorts of issues here, but regardless, you still get to see what season mode's all about here, and although I may have came off a bit harsh, it may be something that you'd still enjoy. Smackdown 2 Know Your Role shined in multiplayer modes and even today I think that's where the fun is. The fast paced arcade style of matchups really are better when you're playing with friends and you won't have to think about what you're doing too much either, you can sit and enjoy a few beers while kicking your friends ass because the gameplay really isn't that deep, but it's still enjoyable. This, along with the first Smackdown game, were the foundations for what was to come though, and the Yuke's wrestling engine would keep getting enhanced year after year. We have now totally moved on and 2K have developed their own wrestling engine which really came into its own this year with 2K22 and it's going to be interesting seeing where that goes in the future, but with the old Smackdown games that we've been looking at, things would only get better when the series moved on to Sony's next console, the PlayStation 2. Just bring it, shut your mouth, here comes the pain and the Smackdown vs Raw series all brought something new to the table, with here comes the pain in particular remaining a fan favourite, and all these games will get covered on the channel. 
I just have difficulties finding the time really to get reacquainted with these old classics, but I will cover the PS2 games in the future. Smackdown Shut Your Mouth was a personal favourite of mine, but I want to do the Smackdown games in order of release, so Smackdown Just Bring It will be the next WWE game covered on the channel. As for Smackdown 2 Know Your Role, I'd say it's worth playing again for a few exhibition matches. You do gain a new appreciation for how things have moved forward when you revisit the older wrestling games, and you do remember thinking back then that it could never get any better than this. So yeah, have a few games and have fun with it. The season mode though, uh, unfortunately it wasn't as good as I remember, but that's just a personal thing. You might think differently and you might have a whole lot of fun with it. Thanks for watching this one guys, and take care. So I wasn't planning on covering Smackdown Just Bring It so soon, but seeing as I've been feeling unwell recently, I thought I could take it easy while recording game footage and spend a few days with the game before talking about it for today's video. This is a WWF game that back in the day I didn't own because I didn't own a PlayStation 2 when Just Bring It got released in November 2001. The console was already out for around a year and I was lucky enough to play some PS2 games at a friend's house including Smackdown Just Bring It, but I simply could couldn't afford the PS2 back then. It wasn't until I saw Smackdown Shut Your Mouth and GTA Vice City in action that I said to myself, alright, I need a PS2 ASAP. But during most of late 2001 and 2002, I was mainly playing on a Dreamcast and putting in an unhealthy amount of time into the likes of Shenmue and uh, Crazy Taxi. Smackdown Just Bring It was a game I played a few times with friends, but that was really the extent of it. So I'll hopefully be able to give a fresh perspective in today's video, seeing as I just got done with Smackdown 2 Know Your Role on PS1, and I'll also hopefully be able to appreciate the upgrades that the next console generation should bring to. First, the opening video, how good was this intro? Ukes would get into the habit of just playing the Smackdown TV intros during their video games, but here we get a full blown CGI video introduction that still looks really good today. Of course, absolutely none of this has been captured with real in-game footage, and you may be thinking the developers were kinda pulling a fast one by showing these awesome character models in the opening video, when in reality, the characters look nothing like this, but this kinda thing was pretty common back then, so you can't be mad. It looks good and it's a pretty creative opening too. Get to the title screen and you'll hear Michael Cole welcome you to the game. WWF Smackdown! Just bring it! Let's go straight to an exhibition match and I'll give you my first impressions after spending a ton of time with the PS1 Smackdown games recently. First of all, Just Bring It looks insanely good compared to Smackdown 1 and 2. The PS2 WWE games would only get better in terms of visuals and you may look back at Smackdown Just Bring It nowadays and say it looks awful, but when you take that leap from PS1 to PS2, it's legitimately incredible how the visuals have been updated. We have full motion entrances for the first time in a PlayStation WWF game no more watching a superstar walk to the ring with just an entrance video playing in the background. We see the whole entrance inside the arena from start to end. Start up a match and it's night and day compared to Smackdown 2, know your role, it really is. Your character has weight, there's a certain momentum when you walk and run and you don't just zoom across the ring at the touch of a button anymore. Things have been leveled out to take away that fast paced arcade style of gameplay with Ukes definitely wanting just bring it matches to feel more authentic. We'll talk about that a bit more in a moment though. Just look at this compared to the PS1 Smackdown games, it truly is the next step. We have got a full 60 frames per second in game, characters look great, the arena too looks more lively, the additional lighting in the bigger venue really does make a difference. We have a fully interactive referee, we have commentators calling the action at the announce tables, there's a ton of detail on the superstars ring gear that simply wasn't possible in previous entries. Things don't look as blocky or robotic anymore, this is what a next generation upgrade should look like. 
I don't know what it is, maybe it's just because I don't appreciate it anymore because I don't game as much, but it doesn't feel like we see these kind of huge leaps in graphics and gameplay anymore with new generations of consoles. This right here though, this kind of complete change for a sequel that saw new hardware was the kind of stuff that made you want to upgrade. I couldn't upgrade because I didn't have the money, but Smackdown Just Bring It along with Grand Theft Auto 3 were enough to make me realise that the PlayStation 1 and my Dreamcast were pretty much done for. You've been watching me play my first Just Bring It match in around 20 years and yeah, I had fun with this one. The only thing that was notably bad was the commentary. Smackdown Just Bring It was the first Ukes WWF game to include play by play commentary so you can't be too harsh, but they use the build a sentence method here where wrestlers and moves are inserted into a bunch of predetermined sentences and it's just funny to listen to. It's also pretty repetitive. What's going on? It's too dangerous. I've never seen a fight like this before. That must hurt. Michael Cole and Taz didn't record too many lines for Just Bring It it seems because I was already hearing the same lines in just one match, but that's really the only thing I could critique after just one game. Let's go out and take a closer look at what's different in comparison to the PS1 Smackdown games. The button layout in Smackdown Just Bring It is pretty much the same as previous entries so it would have been easy for grapple fans to pick this one up and play right away. Grapples are performed with circle, square is your defensive button, triangle runs, L2 is your taunt button, R2 lets you change which character you're focusing on, R1 is your action button for getting out of the ring and all that stuff, and the L1 button performs your finishing move. There are changes to the grapple system though, Smackdown Just Bring It introduces grapple states and with this comes more move variety for each superstar. You can grapple as normal by tapping the circle button and performing a move. You can also pick your opponent off the mat and enter a lockup state where you'll get a chance to pull off bigger, more damaging moves. And you can also perform a different set of moves when your opponent's in a groggy state. The amount of wrestling moves and holds you can now perform has been multiplied and that's only a good thing. Speaking of move variety, superstars now have two finishing moves, so Chris Jericho for example has the Lion Salt and the Walls of Jericho available as finishers, again giving players more freedom and more choice when playing matches. The strike system is similar to previous entries, though some superstars have been given more customised strike combos. The countering system, however, has been completely reworked. From what I gathered, almost every single move in Just Bring It, with the exception of finishing moves, can be countered by tapping the square button at the right time. This is standard practice nowadays of course, but back then this was quite a big deal. A ton of counter animations have been added to the game that will trigger depending on which move you're trying to reverse, and it does make the bell to bell action flow much better with moves no longer getting cut off with the same counter animation. A nice presentation upgrade comes with Superstar Interference, a small screen appears in the corner showing the interfering superstar at the entranceway before they rush down to the ring. It's a small thing but it's still good and this is a little feature that can only be found in Smackdown Just Bring It. Further engine upgrades can be found in special match types which we'll take a look at in a moment but to wrap things up here, Smackdown Just Bring It when compared to Smackdown 1 and 2 was truly the beginning of the Smackdown games becoming more realistic in terms of flow and pacing. There was still a long way to go of course and it can also be argued that no wrestling game has been able to truly emulate what a real wrestling match really plays out like, but Just Bring It definitely gave fans a glimpse of the future by presenting a WWF game that was truly next gen. Here's the complete unlocked roster and we've got 44 superstars this time, a significant downgrade from Know Your Road 66 selectable superstars. The roster's kinda odd too for when this game got released. From spring 2001 onwards, the invasion angle completely took over WWF programming yet there really isn't many big WCW or ECW superstars available here. We do get the likes of Jerry Lynn, Rhino and Tajiri but there's no Booker T, no Rob Van Dam and no Diamond Dallas Page. 
The Invasion Ring Mod and Ring Apron is also not available in the game and instead we have the July 2000 fully loaded graphic, so when Just Bring It got released, the roster was already pretty dated. Quite a lot of superstars were removed from the game too during development including Tiger Ali Singh, China, Gangrel, The Mean Street Posse and Mark Henry. These guys were removed because they were either fired or they were sent back to developmental. Fred Durst of Limp Bizkit can be unlocked as a playable character, apparently if the WWF wanted to use Roland as The Undertaker's entrance music in the game, then Fred had to get included in the roster. And there's not a lot more to say here about the selectable characters really, it's a bit of a letdown both in terms of superstar count and the superstars included for that time period. Jerry Lynn getting included is pretty awesome, it's good to have guys like Raven 2 and Rhino, but I'm guessing the extra work that Ukes underwent when developing for a new console was the main reason for both the low amount of superstars and the somewhat dated selectable wrestlers and arenas. Speaking of arenas, we have quite a curious choice here. There's only one pay per view arena that sort of resembles WrestleMania 2000, however, there's a wide selection of ring mats and aprons available to add a further level of customization. You can also unlock the SmackDown Fist Arena, the UK Insurrection Arena, and the WrestleMania 17 Arena. So, while this maybe doesn't seem like a whole lot now, back then it was quite decent. Again, we can only put these choices down to the developers getting used to the new hardware, the improvements made in the next Smackdown game are absolutely jaw dropping so you have to give them a pass here, it's a pretty common occurrence when a new console hits the market. match types then, and unfortunately we've lost casket matches, but we gained something that most would probably think's a fair trade off, 6 man tag matches. The PS1 could only handle 4 guys in the ring at the same time, but Smackdown just bring it allows 6 guys in the ring at the same time, so you can now play 6 man tags, 6 man battle royals, even Armageddon hell in a cell matches are now possible. Tweaks have been made to other matches, for example the belt no longer swings around like crazy during ladder matches, the hell in a cell match match plays like know your role however it looks a hell of a lot better, TLC matches have been included, 3 stages of hell matches are also available, the backstage areas have been vastly expanded upon and your superstar now has the ability to fight out in the streets and even in the WWF New York restaurant, there's more than enough to do here and you'll quickly forgive Ukes for excluding those casket matches, let's be honest they weren't all that special anyway. Keep in mind that 2 to 6 guys or girls can now compete in most matches too and there's only minimal slowdown when things get busy. Again, you can forgive this seeing as it's the first PS2 entry in the Smackdown series and any slowdown present really isn't all that distracting. Last man standing, street fights and ultimate submission matches have to be unlocked through story mode which we'll look at in a moment and you'll also be able to tailor matches that you're liking in the match rules menu, so if you want to turn off submissions in a single player match, you can do that if you want. Royal Rumble matches, slobber knockers, survival matches, king of the ring tournaments, all that stuff's included too. We've got a few creation modes, we've got create a stable, create a taunt and of course create a superstar. Create a stable self explanatory and I don't think I need to talk about that one too much. Create a taunt has been given a significant upgrade though, last time around we could only pick 2 predetermined animations to stick together but now we can link together 4 animations and we can also modify separate animation frames, there's also a wide variety of animations available so maybe you'll be able to come up with something that's recognisable. Create a wrestler is now absolutely jam packed with customization options with just bring it really taking create a wrestler mode to the next level, there's face and body morphing, detailed colour edit an absolute ton of different attires and different parts, and it's all put together using a layer system where you can add more than one layer to a specific body part. This lets players add vests on top of shirts or jackets on top of vests, all that kind of stuff. For the creative players out there, this would have been a great time waster, and WWF game fans were getting closer to creating superstars that were actually recognisable. Again, pay no attention to my dude here, I've no idea what I'm at, but I can definitely appreciate the insane upgrade that's gone on here with create a wrestler mode and again it truly feels like a significant evolution. You'll be able to edit abilities, stats and character logic, this is gonna play into story mode once again, you've got the option of not only editing your created wrestlers movesets but you can edit pre existing superstars movesets also, and you can also listen to wrestler theme music when setting up entrances. I do wish I was better or more patient with these creations.
Operation Mode so I could show you their true potential, but take a look online and you'll see what others were able to make. Thank god for community creations though in the new games for guys like me. Ok, story mode. I was a bit of a dick when it came to know your roads career mode so I'm hoping Just Bring It lets me redeem myself a bit, and I'm hoping I can wrap up today's video on a high note, so let's see what's going on here. Just for the record, I've never played this season mode before. It's the only Smackdown game where I haven't played the full one player experience. So, I select The Undertaker, and the first thing I notice is the text seems to be in the wrong place during cutscenes. That text should be down in the lower third of the screen, so I think that's an emulation problem. I'm playing this upscale too, so I think I fucked this up myself somehow. Secondly, I downloaded a game save so I could show you guys the entire roster, and whoever uploaded that game save also created a wrestler who just so happens to be the World Wrestling Federation Champion. So I'm gonna delete that save game, and I'm gonna try to fix the text. Well, the text I couldn't fix. I turned off every enhancement, I set everything to native. I'm doing something wrong obviously, but fuck it, I'll just put up with the text being in the wrong place. It's a small price to pay for the bump in resolution. So I clear out the memory card, I start a fresh game, I go to select The Undertaker, but it turns out the American Badass is actually the WWF Tag Team Champion by default. What a pittance. I'm aiming high here from day one, I want the WWF Championship so I'll go with The Rock instead. Big Vinny Mac wants me to challenge for those tag titles and I say no. We then see a great little show introduction using in-game character models, and just like my first attempt at recording career mode, Edge comes down to the ring and he calls out the WWF champ. He instead gets the great one though, and we've got another choice to make. I can talk smack to this Rudy Poo candy ass, or I can fight him. I'll go with a fight thank you, and this is already such a great improvement by the way, these choices immediately give the game replay value, and it feels like we're in control of your character's story. Anyway, I beat up Edge, Vince McMahon comes out being all pissy because I took the initiative, so he books me in a match against… uh, Edge. But it looks like we won't be simulating other matches on the show, which already makes Just Bring It Story Mode leagues better than Know Your Road's Career Mode, in my opinion anyway. So I go to Smackdown and I beat up Albert because he too thought he could challenge the Great One, and I find out here that I'm also the number one contender for the WWF title, so it paid off to turn Vince down, and already I'm getting my WWF title shot at WrestleMania 17. That no good bastard Vince McMahon announces that he's gonna be the special referee but still, I go to Mania, Rock and Austin steal the show, Rock wins a tremendous last man standing bout to capture the WWF Championship, and I I've completed story mode? What? What? <laughs> I've wrestled three matches and I've completed story mode? Uh, okay, so the goal must be to get to WrestleMania, and seeing as I picked The Rock, my journey was fast tracked, so I try again with someone else. Let's go with Crash Holly and fucking Vince and those tag title shots man. I'm gonna say no again and see what happens in the arena. There's Eddie Guerrero coming out, Eddie says the exact same thing that Ed said earlier. This time I won't go down to the ring and fight him though. Ah, uh, Christ ok, Crash is talking about getting a title match against The Rock also. I'm starting to think that story mode isn't as varied as oh, oh wait, I remember this from Shut Your Mouth. You can walk around the arena and on the streets in first person mode and you can bump into different superstars. There's nobody in the main hall, there's nobody out on the streets. I go to the parking lot and… What's this creepy bastard doing here? Seems like he doesn't have any time for poor little Crash Holly. He says he's busy, probably forking out some hush money or something. I don't know, but I end up in the same position as before, fighting the guy I interrupted earlier in the show. I beat Eddie Guerrero, I go to Smackdown where Jeff Hardy has replaced Albert, this time though I'll stay backstage instead of fighting just to see if something different happens and… wait wait wait, Jeff's the number one contender now just because I didn't show up? That's the fucking easiest way to get a main event Wrestlemania match, like ever. I'm told backstage that William Regal wants to see me, I go downstairs and see Earl Hebner, and there we go, I can now go for the hardcore belt or I can go see what William Regal wanted. So the decisions you make are pretty crucial in steering your story mode down different paths. 
Through the conversation with Regal, we can challenge for the IC title or the light heavyweight title. So yeah, there is some variety in terms of storytelling, but I wonder if it ends again as soon as I win a championship. I challenge for the light heavyweight title, I beat Tajiri on SmackDown for the belt, and no, the story mode actually continues on. Man, playing with The Rock really does speed up the whole process, doesn't it? I'll leave the story mode for now, but this is good. By today's standards, of course, it's not much, but back then, the ability to choose different answers to questions in order to take your superstar on different paths with different matches and new opponents, all this would have been amazing back in the day and yes, without a doubt, it's better than the career modes found in SmackDown 1 and SmackDown 2. SmackDown Shut Your Mouth would expand upon Just Bring It Story mode greatly though, but we'll look at Shut Your Mouth in an upcoming video. I'm pretty sure many of you watching today's video are going to look at those character models and move animations and think, man, this looked pretty rough. And you'd be right in thinking so. Just Bring It did not utilize the full capabilities of the PS2 as evidenced by subsequent WWF games, but as mentioned at the top of this video, you have to give them a pass because it's the first WWF game on a new console. When you come from SmackDown 2 know your role in the PS1 though, it's really incredible how Ukes managed to completely upgrade the fundamentals and create a new wrestling game while still retaining what made the previous game so much fun. There isn't a change in Just Bring It that's bad, every last thing that was changed was changed for the better, with the only things I could really complain about being the roster and the commentary, but you can forgive the roster due to the extended development time, and you can forgive the commentary because it's the first time Ukes tried to implement it, although honestly I think the commentary in WWF Attitude and even WCW Mayhem were better than Just Bring It. When this got released though, it would have been the top dog. There was no point playing past wrestling games because you just wish you were playing Just Bring It. But Smackdown Shut Your Mouth would get released the following year and really, that game would make Just Bring It pretty redundant. A much bigger roster, a story mode built around the first WWE draft, a much cleaner looking game with updated animations, updated character models, loads of arenas and just a ton more fun to play through. Smackdown Shut Your Mouth would end up being one of my favourite WWE games of all time, and I'm looking forward to covering that one very soon. To close this video, I did have fun with Just Bring It and it was honestly better than what I anticipated, and I think I got even more enjoyment out of it thanks to covering the PS1 Smackdown games recently on the channel. If you decide to go back and play this one, remember what came before it and you'll definitely have a ton more appreciation for Just Bring It. Thanks for watching guys, and take care. I remember walking into a game store and seeing Smackdown Shut Your Mouth for the very first time. Here in the UK we have a game store chain named uh, Game and they would let attract modes from various games play on their big screens as you walked in the door. I don't know if they still do that because I haven't been in one of their stores in years to be honest but I walked in one day and a match from Smackdown Shut Your Mouth was playing on the screens. It was Chris Jericho versus somebody, I can't remember who, but it was at that very moment when I decided I had to get a play. PlayStation 2. I was really impressed seeing GTA 3 in action and when Vice City came out I was blown away by the look of that particular game. I'd thought about saving up for a PS2 after seeing Vice City gameplay but Smackdown Shut Your Mouth completely sealed the deal for me because it looked amazing. Not only was it a big graphical update from Just Bring It but the gameplay looked smooth as butter. New animations for reversals and moves made Shut Your Mouth look incredibly fluid and I was blown away watching Jericho transition from one move to another while countering his opponent in an almost seamless manner. So I was completely sold from the moment I laid eyes on the game all the way back in 2002. After saving money where I could and getting a little help from relatives, I picked up a PS2 at the end of 2002 along with Vice City and Shut Your Mouth, and I'm almost embarrassed to admit how much time I put into those games because they were both so so good. 
I haven't been feeling the best recently so I went back and played some Shut Your Mouth to see if it still holds up today. I recorded a lot of footage so let's take a look at Smackdown 4 in today's video. Put the game in your PlayStation 2 and you'll get greeted with the Smackdown opening video from 2002, the Beautiful People version by Marlon Manson. It's absolutely perfect for getting you fired up and I remember letting this video play out most times I started a new session. The menus in the game have been given a complete overhaul with video screens showing some WWE action while you make your selections. And I feel this is important to point out too because the menu system in Just Bring It was a little bland and a bit, I don't know, a bit generic. We don't have a terrible amount of options to choose from in the main menu, we have a create mode, a season mode, exhibitions and options. We'll take a look at the main choices in a moment but first let me show you the basics and show you how the game plays. Now I know it doesn't look like much now but these character models were insanely good at the time and they were a big upgrade from Just Bring It. During this era the models got better with each release and the guys and girls in Shut Your Mouth did benefit from a graphical overhaul but admittedly there are some issues with characters. Characters. Booker T has some of the widest eyes you'll ever see and this would be fine if he didn't stay so wide eyed for his entire entrance. With DDP they try to give him that positively paid smile and it ends up looking a bit creepy. And when folks talk to you backstage in season mode their mouth movements look a bit off but that's the only real complaints you can have for a game released in 2002. Entrance animations look spot on, the arenas and stages look very very good with each pay per view and weekly show feeling different so the overall presentation for Shut Your Mouth is excellent. In comparison to Just Bring It, it's on a complete different level. Take a look at this side by side and you'll be able to appreciate the graphical upgrade a whole lot better. On surface level, not a lot has changed when it comes to the basic gameplay. You have a strike button, tapping X performs a normal strike while adding a direction on the d-pad gives a stronger strike or a strike variation. And just look at how they captured the rocks punches with the opponent getting up again to feed for another. This is one of the key elements that makes Shut Your Mouth a lot better than its predecessors but more on that in a moment. You can tap X a few times without a direction to pull off a combo, the rock has his spit punch for his third strike. Topping Circle performs an Irish Whip, you can top a direction after topping Circle to throw your opponent wherever you want, and pressing a direction at the same time as Circle is going to perform a grapple move. There's three different states your opponent can be in which determines what moves you're going to perform. There's Normal Standing, Stunned and Groggy. Getting your opponent in a stunned state can be as easy as lifting him off the mat and grappling with him, though getting your opponent groggy can be a little trickier. Certain moves can make your opponent groggy and set them up for a finish in a seamless manner. So for example, Triple H can perform his face break or knee smash to move straight into a pedigree. You can also double top circle to lift your opponent up and they'll be groggy for a limited time or you can kick your opponent in the midsection and create a small window of grogginess to pull off a bigger move or a finisher. If you tap the finisher button again when your wrestler's laying the smackdown you'll get this 360 camera effect but it only works in one on one matches. Now this grapple system isn't perfect and the next smackdown game would introduce probably the best ever grapple system in any smackdown game ever but you will adopt pretty quickly. Ukes did a wonderful job job in animating moves and counters in a way that puts your opponent in various states but this also means you'll need to learn the best moves for your chosen wrestler depending on the situation or state you want your opponent to be in. The thing is though, it's so much fun playing with different wrestlers in this game because for the first time ever, proper care has been taken to make wrestlers play vastly different from one another. Take Kane for example, one of Kane's moves will make him no sell punches and set his opponent in the stun state. It's a brilliant way to set up moves and make the transition into the next move more unique. He also has a move where he takes a punch but he hits his opponent right back and he also gets out of the ring the same way he would on TV. Rob Van Dam, one of my favourite characters to play as, floats around the ring pulling off high risk and high flying moves like no one else in the game. Previously everyone played the same but when you choose someone like RVD you'll want to learn how to go from move to move to make these jaw dropping sequences that were not possible in other games. Kurt Angle's another one who plays different, the Olympic gold medal isn't just a suplex machine, he's well versed in submission wrestling and you can get submission victories pretty early on if you remain focused and 
and choose his submission moves over his more impactful moves. These are only 3 wrestlers I've mentioned, most of the big names in the game have enough unique moves and animations that you're gonna feel like you're actually playing as that superstar and not the same guy with a different model and different finishing move. This all sounds like fundamentals in today's games, but back then this was pretty revolutionary. Anyway, just to get back to Rock and Farouk here quickly, the square button lets you dodge, jump over, get behind and leapfrog your opponent. Again, another great tool for setting up the next move. Reversals and counters are performed with the square button too and as much as I can praise this game, I will say the countering system isn't what it needs to be. Topping square on its own should counter a strike while a direction with square counters moves. It's very hit and miss, especially when you haven't played the game in a long time, so do keep that in mind when you go back to Smackdown shut your mouth. All in all though, the upgrades to the fundamentals are extremely impressive and you can tell that wrestlers and wrestling matches have been studied in order to create these move transitions and unique animations. It plays fast too, as authentic as the moves are it still feels a little arcadey, but it works well. New animations don't only extend to strikes, grapples and counters though, weapon animations have also been overhauled with chair shots looking more impactful and pushes from the ladder looking more devastating. Your opponents go on a bounce off the floor when pushed off hell in a cell and you too can bounce on the floor after jumping off the smackdown fist or the king of the ring chair at the entrance way. Yeah, this was actually a pretty big deal back then and many fans will recall jumping off the fist and doing all sorts of crazy moves. You can also remove the turnbuckle pads for the first time to do extra damage. Damage. And speaking of extra damage, you can fight in a wide range of backstage areas. Before we take a walk around the arena though, let's take a quick look at the roster. The roster we've got here is a good one. It's a post invasion roster with many guys making their SmackDown debut, including Billy Kidman, Booker T, Brock Lesnar, Kevin Nash, Hollywood Hogan, DDP, and Ric Flair. There's 60 superstars here in comparison to the 44 found in Just Bring It, but again, remember that extra care has been taken this time around to make all the superstars unique in terms of movesets and animations. You can unlock new attires for wrestlers as you play through the game and some of these new attires are good. You can get the black and white and red and yellow Hulk Hogan for example. It is a good roster with the only big omission being Scott Hall. Scott got released late into the game's development. He was scheduled to appear but he didn't make the cut unfortunately and his appearances in career mode were replaced with X-Pac. Alright, match types. The Hell in a Cell makes a return and, as mentioned, there's a few new animations for throwing your opponent off the cell. Ladder matches are here, along with TLC matches, and upgrades to weapon handling and weapon strikes make these matches a lot more fun. You can have cage matches too, but make sure you're on the ball here or your opponent can escape in a matter of seconds. I quit matches make a comeback where you'll beat your opponent so badly that they have to say the magic words into the microphone. What else have we got here? Ah, uh, the wonderful special referee matches that are an absolute joy to play with friends. There's nothing quite like being an asshole referee and I do wish this mode was brought back in newer releases. There's Iron Man matches, 3 stages of hell matches, table matches, a ton of multi-man matches including tornado variations, battle royals, royal rumbles and you've also got a total of 6 superstars in the ring at the same time while maintaining a solid 60 frames per second. What many fans will remember though is the backstage areas available in hardcore matches. In Smackdown Shut Your Mouth matches may start in the ring but you can travel to other areas. From the arena corridors to the boiler room, from the streets outside to the subway station, all the way to Times Square New York and WWE's The World Restaurant. What's special about all these areas though is the fact that they're all linked together. You can make a journey all the way to Times Square and hop on the subway to go back to the arena if you want to. So gone are random backstage areas and instead you've got this whole map you can explore with quite a lot of interactive items and hotspots along the way. Backstage fighting isn't for everyone, I know, and many prefer to keep the action in the ring, but I think it's great that the options available to explore different places and take your matches to new locations. Before taking a look at season mode, I'll show you guys creation mode. I always feel like I have to show creator wrestler off even though I'm absolutely horrible at making superstars. Tons of options available this time around and there's a ton of pre-compiled movesets that'll help you make your creations as authentic as possible. I downloaded a save file some guy uploaded featuring a ton of created superstars and let's see what we've got here. There's the crow, looking great, nothing to complain about there. Big Papa Pump Scotty Steiner, nothing like doing the 69er with Scott Steiner guys, remember that. 
We've got, oh, it's Harry Potter. He has quite the unfair advantage, doesn't he? Super Saiyan Goku likes to dance and he also likes to wrestle, apparently. What this game really needs, though, is carnage and his creepy carnage entrance. That's a bit too much. And there's the Incredible Hulk with an entrance quite similar to Bill Goldberg's. As far as created wrestlers go, for the time, these aren't bad at all. I know I couldn't do much better, so congrats to our guy here, Amidial, for uploading these way back in 2003. Do you want to see more? Oh, I know you want to see more. So here's Iron Man entering the ring at WWE Backlash to wreck a few heads. Wolverine's here and it looks like this one's based on Hugh Jackman. Mick Foley's been created because there's not one of the three faces of Foley available in the Shut Your Mouth roster. Captain America is here. Yeah, that's Captain America alright. Samus in her fusion suit. I like that the creator went with a different version of the suit right here. And here's Sabretooth looking like an absolute bum. So this will hopefully give you a good idea of what can be created in SmackDown Shut Your Mouth. You're only limited by your imagination and the customization options available in the game. You can also create animations such as taunts and celebrations. I could never do any better than a little jump in an arm raise. I think this kind of thing was way too limited back in the day, but credit for including such a mode in the game. I'm pretty sure you could try to implement this again in future games before completely giving up on it. Now, for this video, I didn't play through the entire season mode and there's so much variety and branching paths that you'll never see everything in one setting anyway. But what we've got here is a robust single player experience that was put together really well. When you first start season mode and after you pick your character, you'll go through the WWE draft. You have a few options here. You can pick a brand and choose their superstars or you can skip it and let the game decide who goes on what show. If you choose a created superstar, you'll go straight to Sunday Night Heat. But if you pick anyone else, you'll automatically get entered into the draft. I picked Kurt Angle, I ended up on Raw, and before you begin your first match, you'll be placed in a corridor inside the arena and the world is your oyster. You can walk around and talk to other superstars, sometimes this can set up a match, sometimes you'll get punched in the face, most times though it's pointless chatter that doesn't lead to anything at all. Still though, when you see someone standing around, you want to talk to them just to see if something new happens. You can also visit the GM's office to check your stats and ask for a title shot, although natural storyline progression will also lead to title shots. You can visit the shop zone area and purchase unlockables. You can even leave the arena and walk around the streets looking for other superstars who have been kicked out of the locker room. The exploration side of things made Shut Your Mouth Story Mode feel really big. It felt like the possibilities were endless and it was a nice diversion from the typical match after match style of previous games. Just Bring It did have a first person mode too where you walked around backstage, but it was nowhere as big as this. My first storyline as Kurt Angle was all about getting a shot at The Undertaker's Undisputed Championship. A few other guys wanted the opportunity too, so Nature Boy Ric Flair organized a mini tournament to see who would face the dead man. After beating Kane on pay per view, I was named next in line for a shot at the gold. And after agreeing to appear at the UK Insurrection event, I ended up going to Judgment Day where I won the Undisputed Belt. Now, if you take a step back, you can already see there's a lot of variables here that led to this short 3 month storyline. If I picked someone lower on the cards, then I wouldn't have gotten the title opportunity so soon. If I picked the champion instead, then none of this would have happened. I also could have declined to appear at the UK show. And I also could have lost the number one contender match to Kane and the title match at Judgment Day wouldn't have happened. That's the beauty of Shut Your Mouth's career mode. There's a lot of options and a lot of different career paths that you can travel on. And you would have been pretty motivated to see everything the game has to offer by playing season mode over and over again. Real life WWE storylines are also implemented in the game. For example, the Raw and SmackDown GMs wanting to sign Stone Cold Steve Austin. That little piece of business plays out in the video game too as a separate cutscene. And the arrival of the New World Order also plays out in story mode if you follow the correct career path. There's a lot I like about this mode. I wasted a ton, and I mean a ton of time playing season mode when I first got this game, and I know for a fact that I still haven't seen every cutscene and every storyline the game has to offer. You'd need to carefully map out your career progression and make careful decisions to see absolutely everything, or you can just have fun and play without worrying too much about the consequences of your actions. The career mode is very, very good. Some of the backstage free roaming can feel pointless and sometimes it's unrewarding to walk around for 10 minutes only to find no one to talk to, but you can also totally skip the free roaming parts if you want. 
Where Smackdown Shut Your Mouth truly shines is in the gameplay. The bell to bell action that's made much more authentic and fun to play thanks to the upgraded moves and counter animations. You can tell that way more work was put into this one in comparison to previous games, and there's a real effort to make things feel more like the action we see on TV. It's another case of putting yourself back in late 2002 and playing it for the first time though. I'll never forget how excited I was to see the game in action and as mentioned, just seeing a demo of the game inside a store made me want to buy a whole new console. The next game in the series, the critically acclaimed Smackdown Here Comes the Pain, made a ton of improvements that fixed a lot of the issues I personally had with Shut Your Mouth, including the reversal and grapple systems. There's a reason why Here Comes the Pain gets all the accolades when people talk about WWE games on PS2, but Shut Your Mouth sticks with me a bit more because it completely sold me on WWE games for a new generation of consoles. While Shut Your Mouth is an evolution of the Smackdown games that came before it, to me it serves as a new foundation for the greatness that was about to follow, and the next Smackdown game I cover on this channel will look at that greatness in detail. Thanks for watching guys, I hope you enjoyed this one, and take care. When you ask folks to pick their favourite Smackdown game of all time, chances are they'll say, here comes the pain. Released in late 2003 for PlayStation 2, Here Comes the Pain introduced a lot of key elements to the SmackDown franchise while also improving the fast and fun gameplay found in the previous game, SmackDown Shut Your Mouth. Almost two decades have passed since the release of Here Comes the Pain, yet many still call it one of the all-time greats along with No Mercy on N64. So today we're going to take a look at the game and try to figure out why it's held in such high regard. A follow-up to SmackDown Shut Your Mouth was announced on April 2nd, 2003, and IGN confirmed the name Here Comes the Pain 20 days later by badgering staff at THQ. So Yux and THQ were moving away from using The Rock's catchphrases for video game taglines. A few months after the name was announced, at a presentation held in Europe, THQ talked about what's new and Here Comes the Pain, and the list was very, very impressive. Highlights included a new grapple system that expanded players' movesets, weight detection, differentiated wrestler attributes, a new submission system with location-specific damage, an overhaul in graphics and animation, new match types, a new season mode that took feedback from Shut Your Mouth into consideration, an updated roster that also included WWE Legends for the first time ever, so as you can see, there was a lot to get excited about. Personally, I love SmackDown Shut Your Mouth and I always felt that the season mode in that game offered a ton of replay value. At the time it was crazy that so much content was stuffed into one wrestling game, so hearing about all these new additions and here comes the pain was very exciting indeed. As always, let's take a look at the basic controls first, this'll show you what was new in terms of overall gameplay. X is your strike button, hold the direction in for a more powerful strike. Triangle's your run button while square's a general action button, you can press square while running to get behind your opponent if facing forward, or jump over your opponent if you're already behind them. The big update though comes with grapple moves, you now have 4 different lockup states at your disposal and this opens the game up completely to a wide range of new moves for each wrestler. Circle and right performs quick grapple moves, circle and down perform submission grapple moves, circle and up will let your wrestler perform power grapples, and finally, circle and left let you perform signature grapples. Signature grapples are supposed to be just that, specific moves that your wrestler performs in real life. Now, there are some liberties taken here, but there's also a ton of character specific animations that's been added in too, and that really helps each wrestler feel unique. For example, Triple H's DDT looks different from a standard DDT. There's no way to perform front moves without grappling first. You can, however, perform quick moves from behind or when running at your opponent. The countering system has also been overhauled. You no longer just mash a single button in hopes of reversing moves, this time you have two counter buttons, one for strikes L2 and one for grapples R2. This is great by the way, especially in 2 player mode. At first it sounded like Yuke's complicated things, but they didn't, they made countering more fun, but more on that in a moment. If you look up at the top here you can see the special meter filling up as you perform moves, you can also see the new limb damage meter that lets you know how much damage you and your opponent 
opponent's taken and where that damage has been taken. So if you get him in the red, it might be a good idea to try a submission move. Submission moves now have a new tug of war system added. Put it all together and you've got a real feeling of total freedom as you run around the ring doing damage in a variety of different ways. In the ring, here comes the pain's gotten a pretty significant speed boost, so you've got fast arcade action mixed with authentic new moves and it does play absolutely brilliantly. There's been a lot of time taken to give characters unique specific moves and even initial grapple animations really do make your character feel different. And along with this, each wrestler has their own stats. This means characters have both strengths and weaknesses and it's up to you to exploit those weaknesses. In terms of the roster, 25 playable characters are available that were not in the previous game including Goldberg, Batista, Scott Steiner, Ultimo Dragon and John Cena. Legends are unlockable including the Road Warriors, the Iron Sheik, Hillbilly Jim and Roddy Piper. And you've also got a lot of favourites returning including The Rock, Steve Austin, Shawn Michaels and The Undertaker. A lot of care has been taken too when updating superstars from the previous game with The Rock being one of the standouts. And here comes the pain, you'll play as Hollywood Rock and his move animations have been updated to feel like a complete different wrestler in comparison to shut your mouth. Speaking of Hollywood, Hulk Hogan was removed from the game. Two versions of the Hulkster were originally planned, though the select screen pictures are still found on the disc. The Ultimate Warrior was also going to be an unlockable legend, but he too got removed due to a legal dispute. There's quite a few more superstars who got taken out of the game, so check out the Cutting Room Floor website to get all the details. The good news is though that their movesets were retained for Creator Wrestler. We'll check out the creation modes in a moment. It's a good roster and here comes the pain though and it comes down to personal preference really if you like this roster more than the one found in Shut Your Mouth. The incredible amount of move animations and updates to movesets found in Here Comes the Pain though makes each wrestler feel even more unique than the previous game, so do keep that in mind. Match types then, <laughs> look at this list of match types, there's a lot to do and here comes the pain. Along with these matches you can also have regular matches, battle royals, hardcore matches, raw rumbles, tags, tornado tags, there's so many match types that it can be difficult choosing which to play next and that's a good thing. One of the new big match types we have though is the elimination chamber and it's a lot of fun to play. Basically moves you do outside the ring are going to have a pretty big impact on your opponent's health but you're always at risk of getting hurt too and trying to dish out punishment. Countering in this game is easy, it's easy for both you and the CPU, so there's always a risk with every move you try to pull off. First Blood matches also make their Smackdown debut and here comes the pain along with brand panty matches. And you've also got a ton of favourites to play including Cage, Ladder, TLC and Hell in a Cell matches. Combine all these match types with fast and fun gameplay and it's pretty much perfect. You can get all serious with your friends and have a long drawn out Ironman match or you can go to Times Square and ride around on a helicopter. You can put on a three way steel cage showdown or you can have a singles match with two special referees. The choices you've got here are incredible. The new grapple system just works, it's easy to remember your favourite moves and which grapple state you need to be in, so you've got the ability and freedom to set up some great spots and you can play out matches how you want them to play out. This sounds like basic stuff I know, but sometimes we don't realise how restricted we can be with certain wrestling games. Here comes the pain takes the restraints off and it lets you go as crazy as you want and once you've played one match you instantly want to play another. Let's take a look at the creation modes. With each Smackdown game that was released during this era, there was always updates made to create a wrestler mode, we didn't ever go backwards really. And here comes the pain is no exception. You can create more animations this year if that's your thing. Stables can be added and removed from the game, you can edit each superstar's move set too or create a new one and this is pretty handy if you want to see the default moves and how to pull them off. And of course you can create your own wrestler. Like before, I downloaded a few save files so you guys can look at a few creations. Folks were making guys like Sting and the Ultimate Warrior, Scott Hall, Bret Hart and Hulk Hogan. There's also some fictional characters here like Freddy Krueger, the Grim Reaper and the Joker. So this will show you right here what was possible within the creation suite. At the time, this was awesome and I know some of the characters don't look too great nowadays but back then fans were getting super creative with the options they were given. Makes you kind of appreciate how far we have come in terms of character creation within wrestling games.
All right, season mode. First things first, it's very, very customizable. You can select who's involved in your season, which brand they're on. You can add a bunch of created wrestlers too if you want and remove top stars if that's your thing. It's all completely your choice. I'll start with all the defaults here and I think I'll choose someone who's kinda trying to break into the main event scene. Let's go with Big Papa Pump, Scotty Steiner. There is one question people always ask me. What are Samoa Joe's chances of beating Big Papa Pump at Sacrifice? You got an 8 and a third chance of winning at Sacrifice! Eric Bischoff welcomes Mr. Steiner to Raw and then we get brought to the main menu. The main menu gives us a few options. You can talk to other superstars like last year but you don't need to go walking around in first person mode to find them. This is good because honestly while first person mode was kinda unique it also got a little tiresome after a few months into your career. You can also upgrade your character stats by winning matches, you can buy items in the shop zone, check out superstar profiles, add more wrestlers to the season, or you can add or edit stables. The level of customization again is incredible. After getting punked out by The Rock who sang me a little song and after watching The Hurricane show his displeasure at The Rock's recent change in attitude, I decided to have a meeting with Eric Bischoff. The big bad booty daddy wants a world title shot but I'm happy to build my way up and earn the opportunity. So I'll start with the hardcore championship. I make RVD top out to the recliner and Scott's career starts off well with a hardcore title victory on night one. The next week Vince McMahon shows up to throw his weight around and he says it's up to him if I main event mania next year but I'm going to prove myself to both Eric and Vince. A hard fought hardcore match on Raw will hopefully get the big bad booty daddy a match at the next pay per view backlash but unfortunately the card was too stacked and there was no space for the genetic freak. Jerry Lawler meanwhile thinks it would be a good idea for Scott to challenge for the tag team titles. No thank you. Scott wants the world belt and Scott's only interested in singles competition. Scotty bumps into Goldberg backstage and again I have the option of possibly forming a tag team. I'm not interested so I piss Goldberg off and lose some superstar points in the process. It's no big deal. I'm now thinking I should challenge for the IC belt seeing as I'm big pop a pump and I'm that damn good. So Eric grants me a shot and now Scotty Steiner's a double title holder. Only a matter of time now before I'm shining up the big one. The, the world belt that is. Christian takes it bad and he wants to fight me backstage the following week. Big mistake Christian, big mistake. You can already see how the decisions I've made have shaped this particular run on career mode. If I wasn't challenging for belts I'd get to see other stories play out with some of these being admittedly more involved and more layered but I'm just having fun here and letting you guys see one of the many routes you could take. Taz wants me to participate in a UK tour, Big Papa Pump has no time for glorified house shows so I'm going to pass on this generous offer. I would however like to see Booker T perform a spin rooney but instead he calls me a sucker and I lose more superstar points. I better be a bit more careful. After defending my IC belt against Chris Jericho I bump into Stephanie McMahon at Judgment Day. Big Papa Pump hasn't got a match so there must be some sort of mistake and I need to take this up with upper management. Steph won't stop talking on the phone so I demand to speak to her and get what's rightfully mine, a shot at the world belt. Stephanie gets annoyed, she throws me into the ring with Triple H but I don't get a shot at his belt. Fair enough, I'll beat his ass on pay per view and then I'll go from undesirable to undeniable like top WWE superstar the great Kali. I beat Triple H, I'm feeling pretty good about my upcoming world title match because man I earned it. But Scott's night isn't over just yet, Scott totally forgot he was hardcore champion and not only does Scott Steiner get jumped by Kane, he also loses his coveted hardcore title. Annoying but it's okay, we're on to bigger and better things. It's best to drop the hardcore belt anyway so I can grab the big one, the, the world belt that is. Rod's in Oklahoma and Jim Ross says the people here are great. Steiner's like yeah okay gotta go, got a world belt I need to win. I then defend my IC belt against Booker T and this is getting a bit ridiculous. I'm due a world title shot damn it, and I need to talk to the boss. I just so happened to bump into Vince McMahon and I gotta approach him the right way. Should I be a nice guy and ask him how his day is or should I straight up tell him there's someone I want to fight? Yeah there's someone I want to fight. I've got his attention now, I can ask for a match against Triple H or I can ask for a match against Vince himself. 
I'm thinking I could impress the boss inside the ring and he's gonna say, damn it pal, that Scott Steiner's one hell of an athlete, he deserves a title shot. So I challenge Vince and, uh, oh, oh no, he, he's not happy. He agrees to the match, but he makes it a three on one affair with Steiner facing Vince, Triple H and Ric Flair. Right, the tables have been turned, the numbers don't lie and they spell disaster for Scott on Monday Night Raw. But if I can win this, then that's it. Steiner's the greatest wrestler in the world and I should be the World Heavyweight Champion. Through a lot of grit, determination and sheer luck, I'm able to win the match. It's a Steiner miracle. Bad blood's just around the corner, this is the big night and I'm booked in another IC title defence. Booker T and Kane in a triple threat match. Even Eddie Guerrero can't believe it. To make matters worse, that Jerry Lawler guy asked me again if I want to form a tag team. No Jerry, I don't want to form a tag team, stick your tag team up your ass. If I don't get what I deserve, I'm gonna move to Smackdown, this is getting a bit silly. Lawler must have heard me talk shit because on Raw I have to judge a bikini contest, I'm not even booked to wrestle. So I seek out Eric Bischoff the next week and I tell him I want the chance to prove myself. The absolute madman compares my superstar points to Stacey Keebler's. After all the work I've put in, I'm getting compared to Stacey. But luckily, I rank higher, so yes, Eric wants to finally give me an opportunity. That opportunity is a cage match against Val Venus, so you know what? I'm putting in for a transfer next month. If Freakzilla doesn't get what's coming to him, then I'm off to SmackDown. The following week, Booker T gets another shot at my IC title, I mean, hasn't he had enough opportunities already? I decide to do the J-O-B because this intercontinental belt is now worthless to me and I think freeing up some gold will bring me the opportunity I'm looking for. And would you look at that, vengeance is in Michigan, the state of Steiner. If I don't get booked on this show, I'll, uh, yeah, I'm not booked on this show. Instead, I've got Brock Lesnar calling me a loser while Steve Austin and Goldberg get a shot at Triple H's belt. My freaks and peaks are looking bleak and the big bad booty daddy's starting to feel underappreciated. So it's time to move over to SmackDown and try my luck on the blue brand. Eric Bischoff says I have to stay on Raw for another month and no doubt he'll want me to job out to everyone. Big Papa Pump gives satisfaction but not in the way Eric thinks, so I'll win all my matches just to prove a point. Just to rub it in, I have a meeting with Triple H and I get to take part in the infamous pose down that actually did happen on Monday Night Raw between Hunter and Steiner. A shallow and sad consolation prize seeing as I wanted this man in the ring for a world title match. Even though Freakzilla shows that he's built to go all night long, Hunter still punks me out backstage. So I beat him in the middle of the ring in a non-title match just to let all these fans know the big papa pumps your hookup and the uncrowned world heavyweight champion. I don't get booked at SummerSlam, instead I have a nice conversation with Rey Mysterio and we have a cup of coffee. And then JR approaches me with an interesting question. Does Big Papa Pump want to form a faction? Or does he still want to work as a singles guy? Well, if I lead a group of elite superstars, I could do what Triple H did and get gold around my waist that way. So after a long hard think, Freakzilla says, yeah, this is a great idea. I then jump to SmackDown. JR asks me who I want in this faction, and my first choice is Kurt Angle. Actually, my first and only choice is Kurt Angle because I can only select one guy. This is bullshit, sir. Jerry Lawler must have sent JR to ask me again about forming a tag team, and Ross just worded it differently. I don't want to be in a tag team, I wanted to run a faction. I go backstage the following week and slap Undertaker around because that's how pissed off I am. I'm then forced to participate in tag team matches with Kurt Angle and trust me, I didn't want to do this. Kurt's all like, we need to cause a ruckus and show him what we got. But Scotty Steiner is already thinking about going back to WCW even though it doesn't exist anymore. This is where my season playthrough came to an end really because I had to stop to script this video. Eventually Lita joins up as our manager, it's still not a faction, it's a tag team with a manager. But Big Rikishi wants to join up too and I'm like yeah whatever. Kurt's all excited to give this faction a name but I'm completely checked out. Scott Steiner just wants to go home and lie on the couch for a few years. So yeah, Ministry of Darkness, that'll do. The Ministry of Darkness then took over Smackdown and they won every belt in the world. Steiner became owner of WWE and uh, the end.
Again, you've got so many options in career mode that multiple playthroughs are necessary to see everything that's on offer. If I wanted to, I could have just selected Triple H and started off as the world champion, giving me a complete different path to follow. Or I could have selected someone like The Rock who gets granted a title opportunity right at the beginning of the game. Yeah, there are set paths and challenging for the lower belts can lead you to missing more elaborate storylines, but it's all up to you how you want your season to play out and with a little bit of imagination too, you can make even the most basic season playthroughs a bit more fun. The game rewards you for making different choices, it wants you to play through multiple times or even play a single season mode for a few calendar years so you can see more cutscenes and more storylines. So career mode, in my opinion, is an absolute winner. The variety on offer is phenomenal and for those of you who may have skipped this game for some strange and unforgivable reason, you're going to have a great time seeing where your story ends up. Yes, there are limitations, it's a PS2 game after all, but it's easy to ignore these limitations when the gameplay is so good. To bring it all back, here comes the pains the complete package when it comes to the PS2 Smackdown games, and it's all to do with just how fun it is to play. You may wonder why the next game, Smackdown vs Raw, doesn't get the same love from Grapple fans and I too got a bit curious about this question. It's been years since I looked at these games after all and I played a few quick games of Smackdown vs Raw just to draw a quick comparison and yeah, it's different. Same control scheme more or less, but it's slower. It also has some distractions like extra meters and gimmicky mini games going on but I'll cover all this in a future video. I can say though that it just didn't feel the same and from what I remember, the season mode's a bit more linear too. Again, I'll dig into all this in a future video because I still think Smackdown vs Raw is a good game, it's just not Here Comes the Pain. Playing against the CPU and Here Comes the Pain's great fun, playing against friends is even better. There's so many match options, so many wrestlers and so many new tweaks and additions that yes, even after all these years, it still ranks up there as the best Smackdown game of this era. As mentioned before, I have a more personal connection with Shut Your Mouth and I'll always hold that game in high regard because it made me rush out to buy a PlayStation 2, but Here Comes the Pain perfected what was already a very, very good wrestling game. Let me know your thoughts in the comments, tell me what you liked about Here Comes the Pain because I know I haven't mentioned everything in this video. Thank you very much for watching as always and please take care.